Um, good morning. Today is August 12th. Uh, we have three hospital budgets this morning. I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing, and first we'll be hearing from Grace Cottage. Um, Ms. Sweetnam and Mr. Brown, is it just the two of you presenting today? Good morning. Yes, the two of us will yes. be leading the presentation, but our we have our leadership team on the line as well, so you might be hearing some other voices. <clears throat> okay. Could you um, introduce and identify each person who may be speaking this morning? Aware, absolutely. So, um, I this is Olivia Sweetnam, um, the CEO. Um, Stephen, um, our CFO, is on the line. Chris Boucher is our COO and CIO, um, who's also on the line. Um, Heather Boucher is our quality infection control uh, uh, lab director, who is also on the line. Um, and then we do have some other leadership uh, members on the line, but I think that's m the majority of who you. You'll be hearing from um, today. We also have Crystal Mansfield, who's our director of rehab, um, on the line. So I think I think that's the majority. Okay, um, so I'll have to administer an oath for anyone speaking. Um, so I'll administer the oath, and then after I do so, um, say whether you agree to the oath or not, and then identify your names for everyone who who so swore for the court reporter. Um, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. This is Olivia. Stephen yeah. Brown, I do. Um, I do. Thanks, Heather. Chris, are you on? Yep. Uh, Chris Boucher, I do. Crystal Mansfield, I do. Okay, I think that's everyone. Um, if there's anyone else who pops in who has any evidence to give, um, we'll have to make sure they're sworn in. Um, so I have Heather, uh, Chris, uh, Olivia, Crystal, and Stacy, Stephen Brown. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Brown. Sorry, Stephen. Yeah, I bad handwriting. Um, okay, great. Well, I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Sweetnam, for your presentation. Thank you all for being here, and we look forward to hearing uh, your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you all. Um, thanks, Chair Foster. Thank you for having us this morning. Um, we're looking forward forward to this discussion. Um, and have some slides uh, prepared to walk you through. Um, also looking forward to y'all's questions and comments. Um, this is obviously my first um, budget meeting with you all, but Stephen has been through many, many of these, so he'll uh, he'll be the, our strong, consistent uh, member here as well. So lots of feedback to share, I'm sure. Um, so we'll get moving here and advance my slides. Um, so we have... Um, Dr. Otis here, um, I do love this picture. Uh, just as a FYI to everyone, just last week was our 75th anniversary here at Grace Cottage. We're really proud of that. We do have an employee appreciation barbecue planned for tomorrow for us to celebrate um, our 75th um, anniversary. And the hospital mission and promise continues, which is to serve the healthcare needs of our community to promote wellness, relieve suffering, um, and restore health. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about our focus on primary care um, and preventative medicine. Um, <clears throat> but when we do have our community members here who um, need acute services, whether that's in the ED or on the inpatient side, of course, our goal is to relieve that suffering and restore them back to the best health that we can. Um, our promise to our community is that we go beyond patient care. And I think that anyone who has ever received care at Grace Cottage can attest to this. Um, it's truly, you know, I've worked in hospitals all over um, Canada and the US, uh, Louisiana and Connecticut, and also in Vermont. And there really is, um, nowhere else like Grace Cottage in terms of like the holistic um, focus on um, not only um, the patient's physical well-being, but on their mental well-being, socioeconomic status, 
um, making sure they're discharged to a safe environment. Like truly we care for um, the whole person um, um, to the best of our ability. So I think we fulfill that promise um, and continue to do so. This is um, our hospital vision. So we will provide a personalized, competent, accessible primary care, rehab, wellness, prevention, inpatient care, and emergency services. We do focus on preventative care, um, and we'll talk more about that soon. Uh, we do collaborate with other agencies, and so we well, we also have a slide speaking to that, but we're very um, involved in the community and um, really do focus on um, maintaining those strong relationships uh, with our community that help us um, and help them, you know, with our common sh common shared um, uh, mission to take care of our community um, and to take care of the entire person. Um, and then uh, obviously our vision is that the community will embrace us, Grace Cottage, as a welcoming resource. And, and I would say as a non-judgmental kind of welcoming place, no matter where you are, we'll meet you where you are. Um, the diversity and culture of our region was reflected um, uh, in everything that we do. You can see our uh, old Grace Cottage Hospital ambulance up here. Um, Stephen Brown, who is on the line, who is our CFO, has driven ambulances for Grace Cottage. So you have a lot of uh, multi-talented people on the line as well. And our below picture uh, is some of our nursing directors, as well as our charge nurses um, and our inpatient uh, side of the hospital. Um, in terms of what we do here, so on our hospital side, we have um, 19 beds um, for that are critical access, obviously, um, uh, so acute and swing. And I thought it would be helpful for us to define swing, so we'll do that in the next couple of slides. Um, but for the acute side, um, what that means for us, um, obviously, we don't have um, MRI capabilities. We don't have a kind of... Um, subspecialties. So for us, acute patients are often patients who come in through the ED and let's say, um, you know, they've had a very complicated UTI, they've failed oral antibiotics, they've come in and they're, um, they're displaying a sepsis picture in our ED and we admit them onto the acute as an acute patient and the inpatient side, you know, let's say they need IV antibiotics and they're maybe a little bit hemodynamically unstable. Those are the types of patients we get under that acute bucket, um, complicated pneumonias, UTIs, that type of thing. And we can talk about the type of swing patients we see as well. We have a 24-7 ED. We have two nurses on days and nights. We have providers that are in-house um, for the ED 24-7. Uh, um, it's very busy. We have a slide on our volume but that we are tracking this year to be our busiest year ever in our emergency department. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. Um, diagnostic um, imaging. So we do have a CT uh, and, of course, an X-ray as well. Um, they're quite busy. We also have ultrasound, um, an ultrasound tech uh, who does that as well. We have our lab, so inpatient and outpatient lab. Um, and then we have inpatient and outpatient rehab. Um, I say, I think that our, and I'm sure Crystal Mansfield would agree with me, I think our rehab program is like one of our crown jewels. Um, on the inpatient side for our swing patients, um, they just receive an immense amount of rehab. I think that's why Grace Cottage is so well known as a rehab facility. We have excellent therapists and just the frequency with which they receive uh, rehab on the inpatient side and then the outpatient side is just extraordinarily busy and we will be finished a renovation um, of a building in November to give our outpatient um, therapists some more room to operate. And um, Crystal has um, has had many days recently with over 60 patients scheduled a, a day for outpatient rehab. So they're very, very busy. Um, on the rural health clinic side, we do have primary care. We also have pediatrics. We have behavioral health. We have a therapist as well as um, two nurse practitioners, psych NPs, um, the prescriptive ability. We also have our spoke program and then we have a community health team and we do have a slide on that as well, just kind of outlining what that community health team does in terms of its outreach in the community. And then um, we do have um, our Messenger Valley Pharmacy or MVP across the street, which is a um, uh, definitely a, a busy, um, department for us and uh, really servicing the needs of our community 
Um, I think all of us can appreciate the fact that actually talking to a pharmacist or a pharm uh, pharmacy tech um, when you need something is incredibly helpful, <laughs> um, something we can't always find from our big box um, pharmacy um, colleagues. So if we keep going here, I did want to just uh, speak to this. So I think sometimes we get a little bit confused or, and let me be totally frank. I came from a, a, a medicine, a national home health and hospice company, worked in their corporate department and before worked for a 25 hospital health system. And I don't think I fully understood <laughs> what swing beds are and what they can do until I started here at Grace Cottage. Um, and so swing beds are unique, you know, they're unique to critical access hospitals, they're unique in how they work. Um, and so these are hospital beds that can do both things, they can do acute and long term care. Um, we, they're usually used in rural um, areas, um, uh, depending on our patient needs, and they're very, very important in bridging the gap between short term acute care and long term skilled nursing care, whether that's at home or like in a facility. I think sometimes people think swing beds are like a nursing home. And, and so we have to do a lot of education that no, 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 this is this is a, a bed with a purpose. <laughs> you know, you're here for a specific reason. You're here to do work with therapy or you have a skilled nursing um, care reason, whether that's IV therapy or wound care um, and then and and uh, therapy as well. So we do receive a lot of patients who, you know, are post operative from an ortho surgery or deconditioned from a cancer treatment. Um, I will say, and we, we talk about this a little bit later, I think we have the ability to market ourselves better to some of our larger um, counterparts, Dartmouth being at top of, top of mind, where there might be some areas um, like uh, post-cardiac surgery or um, other types of uh, post-surgical patients that are good fits for us, who would be a good fit for us, you know, who really could benefit from that kind of higher level nursing care and rehab um, functions before they're returning um, to home or long-term care, which as we all know, um, has much less support um, from a nursing, uh, pharmacy or rehab um, standpoint. This uh, these this verbiage is from the Rural Health Research Project. On the right, I was giving an example of Crossing Rivers Health, um, which is a uh, critical access hospital, but we really like their infographic. And if you see something that looks kind of like this from Grace Cottage in the next couple of months, you'll know where we got it from. But we're looking at doing some kind of you know retooling of our of our branding and and just making it more clear how you qualify for a swing bed and what kind of services um, that we do offer. And I think another question people ask is like, okay, well, are is critical access and are these types of swing beds safe? And when we have looked um, at the data um, nationally, critical access hospitals are actually quite safe um, um, compared to some of um, the other uh, avenues of care delivery. So we do believe very strongly in the care that we provide. It's safe, it's efficient, it's high quality care. Um, we got Heather on the line from our quality team who can attest to that. So we're really proud of the care we deliver here. Um, I would also say that when we talk about volume, if you, and of course, in the context of Oliver Weinman too, I think we've all seen a lot of data um, uh, from that project. And we really do appreciate Bruce, Irene, and Danielle, their partnership um, in building out our report. We've had a lot of conversations with them and really do um, uh, respect them and have, you know, I think we've had a really great working relationship with them. Um, but one thing I do want to point out, and there'll be a couple of clarifications here. If you just look at our admissions in terms of admission, uh, number of admissions for acute um, versus swing, you'll see that they look about equal or at least not a huge difference. But then we talk about patient days. So for us here at Grace Cottage, as you would imagine, those acute patients that have like a complicated UTI and failed oral therapy and are you know a little hemodynamically soft and uh, come in to see us through our ED, they're not a long stay, right? They're here for a couple of days. We get them controlled with IV antibiotics. We can we, culture. We can transition them. They become more stable. We get them out the door. We're not in the business of keeping our acute care, our acute patients, any longer than we need to, for sure. Um, but our swing patients who come in, these are patients who might have like, and I, I can give lots of recent examples, but have had a hip revision from a hip fracture and um, popped out. You know. Um, had a uh, needed to have a revision or intense wound care issues or um, 
uh, you know, complicated uh, fracture um, uh, healing. And so these are people who really need a lot of help from us, from Crystal's team on the rehab side, from our, from medically, uh, from our nurses, from our physician. We do have a hospitalist who's here. Um, uh, they rotate on a week by week uh, schedule. So you can see here that when we talk about our total inpatient days, we are much, much heavier on the swing side than we are on the acute side. I think that's relevant because when you see the Oliver Ryman report and we talk about repurposing our acute beds, and, and you know, when we talked about this with Bruce, we're saying like, okay, to 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 who and to where, because we don't have many of these acutes. And and you know. Is there a better place for them? I would argue no, because I don't think they need a higher level of care. I think we're the right level of care for some for these acute patients, the ones we keep. Um, but there's not many of them as a, as a proportion of our total days. And for our swing patients, this is the right place for them, without a doubt. Um, they need that rehab. Um, they need that uh, kind of intensive care before they before they return um, to their home environment. So just clarifying, you know, who is in our in our house at any given time. We also would say if anyone on this call from Green Mountain Care Board or anyone else would love to come, we would just love for you to come visit. So if anyone's interested in coming to see um, the inpatient side and kind of what that looks like for us, we would so welcome you guys. Please feel free to drop us a line and come visit anytime. For our ED um, volume visits, as I said, if we continue at our current clip, this will be the busiest year we have so far. I would also just say, and um, you'll see in the Oliver Reinman report, they have added this caveat at the top. So, um, we went through this clarification with them. Oliver Weinman's initial report showed um, diminishing emergency room visits, and we really couldn't figure out the reason why. But then when we closely read the footnotes, their um, their emergency room numbers were from uh, individuals with a primary residence in Vermont. So as you all know, where we're located, um, whether it's in Dover that has between a 75 to 85 percent, depending on who you ask, um, secondary residents percentage, um, and the the you know tourism population in this part of Vermont, um, it's significant for us. Significant number of people with second homes uh, in Grafton, Townsend, Dover area. Um, so I think that that primary resident is not really a, a great picture. So um, Oliver Ryman has added that footnote in that slide, but you can see we're just, we continue to be very, very busy in our emergency room. Um, and I think they do a really, really excellent job as well. And we'll talk a little bit more in terms of the telehealth support we have there. So as we get into um, our budget conversation, um, uh, in terms of the summary of our budget proposal, and I know I set these slides over in advance, so I'm sure you all have seen this, but um, we're meeting one out of the three benchmarks, so commercial rate growth 2.5, NPR uh, at 12% due to volume, and I can get Stephen to speak to that a little further, um, and then operating margin at negative um, 2.3%. Um, but right before I turn it over to Stephen to just discuss the NPR, I would say that we appreciate that the Green Mountain Care benchmark requirements operating margin is flat. Um, and you know, we do have a slide obviously in our operating versus total margins. I would say though that um, here at Grace Cottage as an executive leadership team, we um, really appreciated um, SVMC's slides, uh, their presentation, especially around their Thrive model. So how we're communicating financial health and well-being in the organization and how we tie our um, projects related to our financial health into a broader messaging, like using that umbrella kind of Thrive model. So we're talking about how we can adapt something similar here to Grace Cottage to really talk about our finances and be more transparent um, with all of our staff and also committed to seeing where we, you know, where we can find those those small pickups, whether it's being more efficient with our staffing, whether it's, you know, adding um, clinic visits where it's appropriate, whether it's picking up some um, additional imaging services. And we'll talk about all of these in later slides, but I think that for us at Grace Cottage, we have consistently had a negative operating margin. I know I'm I'm new to Grace Cottage, but I really do think that that flat 
um, operating margin is a goal for us and it's an achievable and feasible goal with concerted effort. <laughs> and my job is to make sure that we're all aligned to that internally. Um, so although you do see that negative too for, for our coming year, uh, that is with a clear focus and goal to have it flat um, in, in uh, coming year. Um, Stephen, do you want to speak to the NPR? Yes. Um, our NPR growth as clearly can be seen by how our budgeted rate increase is not based on rates. It is simply based on volumes and not from adding any service lines or dramatically changing anything we're doing, simply taking care of those patients seeking our services. As Olivia just pointed out, you know, the ED volume has increased. It continues to increase this year. Uh, our budget for the current year, of course, was based on only the first seven months of last year, and it continued up throughout last fiscal year. So that increase in volume is driving the ED revenue. And the only two things we did budget, as pointed out in the narrative, to change for the coming year, aside from our current level of patients, is a very slight increase in primary care based on hope, hopeful new um, increased provider productivity and encounters based on our new practice management, being able to improve efficiencies there and get each provider to see us one or two more patients per day. The bigger increase was as Olivia discussed, we're renovating an existing space for our outpatient physical therapy department because we cannot meet the demand of those coming to seek, look for outpatient rehab. And that will allow us more treatment space with the ability to add one more outpatient physical therapist in the coming year. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Appreciate it. I also, I think, um, and I know we'll have questions at the end, but I would just also mention that um, to Stephen's point about like, we have to care for whoever comes to our ED, of course. I would also say that although we, and we'll talk about this further as well, but although we have same day appointment availability for our existing patients, as we all know, um, urgent care type of um, access, and especially in this part of Vermont, isn't really robust. So um, as part of our um, clinic, uh, new clinic building as, as part of that redesign um, new space, having that same day or type of urgent care access um, is important to us and is something we're planning for. Um, so, you know, perhaps some of that volume that we see in our ED, could it be shifted to that type of location? It's it's very possible. We, uh, we will see. Um, I would say our fiscal year 2025 budget goals um, is financial stability with plans to appreciate positive operating margin, as I've mentioned, um, to grow our primary care. Um, as Stephen was just talking about, we do have uh, Chris Boucher, who is our new COO, CIO. He has been here in a ISIT capacity, but with a nursing leadership background, uh, who now um, is overseeing our radiology, um, ISIT materials management, and our rural health uh, clinic program, and I think Lynn is also listening in, our rural health clinic director are doing some really exciting work around team-based care models, um, as well as kind of strategically looking at appointment slots and times. Um, and uh, we anticipate we will see pick up there also. And then of course we have our plans for our new primary care building, which uh, we have a picture um, at the end of this presentation. Of course, as Stephen was mentioning, growing our outpatient rehab, we have budgeted for an additional FTE for that. Um, Crystal and her team have just demonstrated the astounding like demand for that. Um, and we anticipate that that will continue to grow, um, especially with the with the current um, stable of of uh, patients they have and um, and uh, wait times and demand for that continuing. And then, of course, focusing on cost saving initiatives and um, operational um, efficiency as well. 
Um, the summary of our budget request, um, so carefully um, thought out financial plan for the coming year, minimal price increase, as you guys have seen with the 4%, um, and really the charge is the minimum necessary to offset inflationary increases and operating expenses and shortfalls and reimbursement. We do have a slide talking about Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement. I would say um, it is in the fun time of, of an election year. We appreciate that we can't forecast, no crystal balls around here, what our tariffs will look like, um, especially if it's just uh, China versus um, a larger kind of um, country agnostic tariff as one um, candidate is proposing. So it's far to really know um, what some of those pressures will look like, um, but we will march forward with the, the best um, knowledge um, that we have available to us. Um, the budget of uh, fiscal year 2025 uh, has the same service lines as Stephen was mentioning. And then he also just spoke to the outpatient therapy uh, and rural health clinic. Um, pharmaceuticals budgeted at costs currently being paid with 3.8% inflation based on projections from our group purchasing affiliation, not our own internal um, calculations. And then supply costs budgeted with two. Uh, to 3% inflation um, expected. I think some of the risks um, for this do include reimbursement. Uh, we do have, as mentioned, we'll just talk about our Medicaid reimbursement, but just kind of uh, the general reimbursement landscape, um, a shifting payer mix. Of course, we have our Medicare Advantage plans that are very labor intensive for us and onerous and have been very difficult at times. Um, and also our staffing costs, I will say this is something that's improved for us really uh, very much, but hard to uh, predict into the future. Um, and I would also say delays in um, ED patient transfer due to system stress. I think this is less of an issue for us than some other hospitals um, in Vermont, but you know, I think always, um, especially uh, in some of our backlogged um, hospitals, um, <clears throat> can be problematic. And then, as I was mentioning, um, change in tariffs or inflationary pressures, it's just hard to really predict what that's going to look like at current time. I would say our opportunities. Um, the design construction of our new clinic building, we're extremely excited about. Of course, we're about 50% of the way fundraised, a little bit less um, for that new building uh, potential or um, projected cost of around um, 20 million. And we are about uh, almost halfway uh, fundraised for that new building. Um, outpatient PTOT, uh, as we said, completed in November. That construction, knock on all of the wood, is actually going really well <laughs> on time and on plan. Um, addition of imaging services with existing equipment. So what this is speaking to is the fact that we have realized that there are some additional um, imaging services we can do. So for example, um, low dose lung cancer screening is something that we in the past have sent out. Um, we have a CT machine though. We actually do have the software to do that type of exam. Um, so uh, investigating that further, there's some you know additional pieces that we need to have in place, like a tobacco cessation program, um, and uh, making sure that our primary care providers are educated and you know have the clear guidelines of when this uh, lung cancer screening test is indicated. Um, but we do send out about I think. Uh, I think the number is about 177 exams and you know with the proper education of our primary care providers you know that number could be double so looking to see where do we have some gaps and where and is it possible for us to meet those internally there's also calcium scoring for um coronary artery disease that's another thing we could do internally but it's a private pay service it's a little more complicated setting up the billing side of things so we're going to focus on lotus lung cancer screening first but there might be other uh, there, there may be other uh, tests and, and um, other capabilities with the current equipment that we have. As I mentioned, we also are interested in growing our referral pool further. So um, not just kind of doing a scatter shot, but looking at you know the 
potentially the DRGs are being targeted with who we're actually um, marketing our swing bed program to. So of those patients that stay longer than, you know, Dartmouth or UVM would um, have anticipated that really do need that further um, rehab and nursing support, um, how can we really proactively go out and market ourselves to those individuals? Um, and so we have some plans um, to do that as well. And then continuing our partnership with Dartmouth um, in uh, our teleprograms, which um, we'll talk about here in just a minute. So the uh, <clears throat> charge increase requested is, isn't adequate to produce an overall positive um, operating margin. Our work continues there. Um, however, um, we have, we are so grateful and we're in such a unique uh, position here at Grace Cottage that we have really, really overwhelming um, community support, which we so appreciate. So um, not only um, does that impact our um, total margin, but also, of course, uh, fundraising for our new clinic. Um, so that is something unique and uh, to Grace Cottage that, that um, we just wanted to point out. The submitted budget, budget reflects uh, minimal operating losses slightly better than those submitted um, for 2024. And then on compensated care, both bad debt and free care um, is you know, budgeted based on level the, what we experienced the first seven months of 24. Um, <clears throat> I would also say that uh, the community benefit, I think Grace Cottage is essential to the community. We're a really a, uh, um, a, a strong, steady, continuous figure uh, in this community. We do have that overwhelming support. Um, uh, financially and otherwise um, from our community. We are also one of the largest employers in Wyndham County. Um, those employees uh, do support local businesses and the local economy. Um, and we've received so many best place to work awards, um, including um, this past year, um, Vermont Business Magazine. We were the only hospital um, who won this award. Um, and I would say that that's not an accident for Grace Cottage. I mean, and I, I know I say this and I'm a little bit of a broken record, but the culture here is is truly special. I think, especially those of us who have done a lot of work around um, quality, culture of safety and just culture in healthcare, um, you see some hospitals who have very kind of strict hierarchies, you know, who, who really adhere to kind of the old school medical model of hierarchy and that really erodes psychological safety in hospitals. And I feel very strongly about that and the, the research, um, the research um, supports that in healthcare quality. And I, I think here at Grace Cottage, all of our staff treat each other, whether they're providers, whether they're nursing staff, whether they're environmental services, dietary, they treat each other kindly with respect and appreciation for each person's um, role. Um, they operate on a first name basis. We all eat lunch together and it, it means something for everyone um, who works here. And everyone's very proud of working at Grace Cottage. And, and I think that you know is borne out not only in um, these types of awards, but also recently you know the Brattleboro Best Of Awards. I think across the board, we do really well um, in this aspect. Partnership with other organizations, I do think that that goodwill extends out as well. We do have um, a memorandum of, under, of understanding and a BAA with Turning Point, um, which do fantastic work. They actually presented to our med staff not too long ago and are uh, coming in this week to meet with our nurses. But uh, this peer counseling kind of support model for those with substance use um, uh, concerns, so they will come into our ED or come into the inpatient side. Um, and, and meet with patients um, and discuss with them kind of a path or road to recovery if it's right for them. And if it's not, just figuring out how they can support them um, in their journey. And they do really excellent work. Also, obviously, Biota Home Health and Hospice, um, our senior solutions or area agency on aging, including our participation in the Wyndham Aging um, Collaborative and um, working closely with uh, BMH and um, the executive team uh, for the for the aging initiative as well, and you can see many below. I mean, Valley Village is our next door neighbor almost. Um, we are in conversations with them. We'll go into our third meeting about um, trying to set up a LNA program or licensed nursing assistant program because the Brattleboro program uh, will be no longer as we understand it. So, how can we support our own pipeline um, uh, through that program? 
also our CARES organization. So whether that's um, Townsend CARES or Brattleboro CARES, but supporting and working with those organizations, Mover obviously as well, and then Meals on Wheels and, and others. Um, so uh, Rescue obviously is a wonderful partner for us. We've got VEMSA right down the street. We do utilize their space. Um, for, for example, our Evade program, which is our um, uh, workplace violence um, kind of preventative, you know, de-escalation, but also physical safety program. So um, they've been great partners uh, with us. Um, and we also are really um, talking to Drew and his staff around the really cool work that they're doing in Brattleboro, uh, pre-post-op visits for ortho, but then how we can really kind of explore that forward forward deployed model um, and see if that's you know possible for us here at Grace Cottage as well. Um, for workforce development, you can see here some of our amazing nurses. We did some, uh, for Nurses Week, we had some, uh, what did we call them? Oh, uh, shift essentials, fanny packs. And we had all neon colors, but everyone ended up with pink ones. But um, we do collaborate with many schools, including uh, Vermont Tech for student rotations, high school students. We have UVM med students here. Um, we uh, definitely we offer many Pride Month events um, and you know really uh, celebrate various healthcare worker appreciation days and weeks, not just nurses. And then some of our awards are below. For equity, that committee was started in um, 2019, um, uh, made up of members who actively engaged and advocated for LGBTQ plus community. We have um, community members, not just employees, which I think is really unique and great um, because we not only get our own employee or provider experiences or uh, thoughts and opinions, but also our community members as well. Um, and we've revi revised policies and procedures to align with HRC's Health Equality Index and have uh, won many awards for that as well. And I think those, we talked about those in uh, previous year presentations, it looks like from when I was flipping back through those. Um, in terms of our look back, so um, previous year's budget, um, our agency staffing is over uh, quite a bit in the first nine months of the current fiscal year. I would say that I'm very, very excited about the fact that our um, agency staffing is almost come to a close. And I'm, we've done a lot of culture work um, on uh, in the nursing side of the house um, since I, I've started in February. We're in such a good place. We've uh, hired uh, many full-time um, nurses in our ED and inpatient side. Um, I would say that one thing um, to, to just consider here, although I think at one point, and I saw this in previous year slides um, that were presented to you all, EM staffing was a temp staffing solution um, that, that was brought in. And although we didn't, we, they're not travelers per se, they were quite a bit more expensive than our travelers. So it, it really the focus was not only on controlling that traveler expense, but also uh, any of our temp staffing expenses. Um, I'm proud to say that we've really got that we've really gotten a, hold, a handle on that, a hold on that in the last 60 days, um, and we uh, to, heading into the fall, we should only have one um, uh, emergency room um, agency staff and two inpatient, which is which is um, much 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 lower for us. Um, and uh, each of those are considering coming on uh, full or part time for us. So the nice thing is we do retain many of our um, agency staff as well. Our goal is to have all employed staff by 2025. Um, we have used contracted labor, not only in nursing, but also diagnostic imaging and physical therapy. Um, I would say that the, the um, rehab uh, reliance on uh, agency staffing is very low, very, very low. I think they have one. Um, diagnostic imaging, though, we have relied heavily. It's been extraordinarily difficult for us to find diagnostic imaging um, professionals. There is not a single ultrasound tech program in the state of Vermont. Um, so we obviously need to recruit outside. It's difficult with affordable housing um, or lack of affordable housing. Um, we're looking at alternative kind of staffing models uh, for diagnostic to make it diagnostic imaging to make it more uh, attractive, I would say. Um, but we continue to, to look for ways forward there. Um, it's definitely uh, an area where, where we struggle to just recruit um, individuals. Um, Okay, so I would say I just wanted to, uh, one of the budget questions was around our telemedicine utilization. We do use tele-ED, neuropsych, and pharmacy. Uh, our patient experience is uh, very positive. 
um, with these programs and the fiscal impact um, is, is pretty limited, um, about 150K um, per year for the first three um, programs and it's a flat rate, it doesn't matter how much we use it. And so we encourage um, our staff to use it as much as possible. And interestingly, um, TeleED was actually telling us and we do you know, frequent meetings with their leadership team, their physician and admin and nursing leaders, that about half of the tele-ED calls that they receive, not that we do, but just Dartmouth for tele-ED holistically, about 50% of the calls um, they receive are actually nurse to nurse. So there's not really a provider involved. But at a small hospital like Grace Cottage, that makes sense. I mean, anyone who's been in the ED, when you have a complete crash a patient who's come in and is fully crashing and you're intubating and running a code, Two nurses isn't a lot, and so sometimes you need that extra set of hands to do documentation in the background, who can run um, medication compatibility checks for you, who can um, just be eyes in the sky to help you get through those situations. Um, so we really do appreciate their partnership and, of course, our providers. So our majority of our, our providers in the ED are APPs, so physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Um, so being able to hit the easy button, um, as we used to call it, one of my, my old hospitals just hit that easy button, um, is that if you need a second set of eyes from a provider standpoint, or, hey, you know, I've really got to the end of my rope here in terms of what I can think to offer, what would you, you know, what do you think is great, but also they can help facilitate um, transfers at that point. If they're seeing, you know, they're looking at it and they can anticipate what they're going to need on their end as well. I would just like to, sh I just wanted to show you some of the um, data that we get back from them. It's really helpful for us. So we see, you know, our discharge dispositions, which day of the week were busiest in terms of how often we're activating tele-ED. Similarly for tele-neuro, you can see time of the day and day of the week. It's kind of comical or maybe not really, but we seem to have a different uh, busiest day of the week for tele-ED and tele-neuro um, both. So it's like, you never know which day is gonna be busiest. It's just kind of across the board. Um, but this is helpful for us too in terms of um, planning. You can see that we do have a lot more teleneurology um, calls than tele-ED generally. We do see a lot of those kind of TIA stroke pictures. Um, of course, with our aging population, that makes sense. Um, in primary care, we do continue to focus on expanding those services. I think we've, we've, we've talked through this. Um, I would say that when we talk about our new clinic, um, I think most of us have been to primary care facilities or, you know, especially those that are somewhat newer, where you're used to there being multiple rooms for a provider. So a provider sees a patient and then they can go to the next room while the nurse is finishing that visit, whether that's administering immunizations, doing an after visit summary, whatever it takes to kind of close out that visit. When we have one office space per provider, it makes it extraordinarily difficult. We are in a log jam for, for our providers um, and their support staff in our current space. And again, anyone who would like to come visit, we welcome you with open arms here, but it's a very old house with creaky floors with narrow hallways. Um, and so we really do run into that. Um, our, our, we're kind of jammed from um, a productivity standpoint. We physically can't get people kind of in and out as fast as we would like. Um, our new clinic where we will move to two rooms per provider with support staff um, will make us so much more efficient. Um, it's really exciting um, to think about. I uh, wanted to mention our home health services because there was a question around if we're planning on providing um, more um, um, VNA type of services or VNH. We don't have any current plans to have kind of four deployed home health services. We are talking with Rescue to understand um, some of their models and potential opportunities with Drew and his team. Um, we don't really currently have any more staff or time, physical space to extend ourselves any further, but we do have a community health team that will that will help people whether they're a patient or not. Um, Claire is such a fixture in our community um, and really her, the way she can connect um, people and services is, is really remarkable and she's so valuable to us. So we do have that um, service for our community. Um, we do um, anticipate raising over a million dollars in fiscal year 25. That of course helps us with purchasing equipment, operating expenses. Um, and we do this through a multitude of ways, obviously meeting with our individual donors and the different events that we have. Um, 
I will also say this is the only place I've ever worked where we have people who come for an ED visit and leave a $10,000 uh, check on the way out because the ED experience was just so far and above anything that they had experienced before. Um, it's just, it's remarkable, but it's the, as Andrea likes to say, um, we, who's our foundation um, and philanthropy expert here at Grace Cottage, um, that that we really do the work. We do the clinical work of um, encouraging people to be so loyal to Grace Cottage because we do treat people with so much respect and care and love um, that it makes it a little easier for her to do her job. Um, capital expenditures, IT mainly, uh, but then obviously the start of construction for our new rural health clinic. Um, and then uh, almost to the end of my slides here, but I wanted to answer your questions about underfunding um, of Medicare and Medicaid. So is Medicare underfunded? Less so than Medicaid, obviously. Um, we are eligible for 101% of allowable Medicare costs and services. However, due to the 2% Medicare sequestration, we're only paid 99% of costs. Um, so that's relevant here, obviously, for our budget, but especially Medicaid. So is Medicaid underfunded? Holy moly, is it ever. So based on our 990 submissions, our shortfall payments versus actual cost to provide charge provide care. So not charges, but our actual cost is, is 2.4 million. And then of course we have our provider tax. So our total cost that we pay to care for Medicaid patients is 3.4 million, which is, is hard. <laughs> That's a hard pill to swallow because we are so committed to our community. We are committed to our Medicaid patients, just the way we're committed to other patients, but that's a massive cost to us. That is our negative operating um, margin. Um, and then just to you know, kind of drive that point home, this is a true recent patient. This is a patient with substance use, injection, drug use history, um, who's uh, unhoused. She is a wonderful patient. We love having her here. She's incredible. She's just a bright light for uh, on the inpatient side. However, this patient was here for under a month. Um, was a, a complex picture required IV antibiotics for endocarditis, which is a heart valve infection you sometimes see in injection drug use, um, especially patient populations. The total facility charge for her stay was about fifty-four thousand dollars. And now that's IV medications. You know, she get the full care. Medicaid paid us about 8,000, so 14% of our bill charges. So when we talk about health equity, I mean, it's just difficult because we do take a bath financially when we're caring um, for these patients, as you saw from the previous slide as well. So we are committed to our community, but it, it makes it difficult from a viability standpoint when the Medicaid reimbursement is, is, is so poor. Um, so the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is just our Act 167. I would say that the statewide recommendations, especially when we talk about um, interoperability um, and affordable housing, transportation, we really, really, really support these. Um, we really support these recommendations. I think a lot of the uh, town hall meetings talked about waste and healthcare. Let me tell you that when we have, um, when we're on Cerner, other hospitals who are on Epic or even other hospitals on Cerner like Brattleboro, when we're doing manual faxes for referral management and then we're getting that information faxed back, we're uploading it into the chart, we're manually closing out a referral. Is there waste in healthcare? Absolutely. Is it required work for the unfortunate kind of clunky system we're currently are operating in also absolutely the same for prior authorizations our medicare advantage patients so we will work on uh, reducing the inefficiencies that we can control the best way we can uh, but some of it's baked into our our kind of our, our system that does not have the type of um, interoperability and seamless communication that we'd like to have um, I would just also say um, the state level solutions that they they recommended, including top of license um, practice, is something that we also um, fully embrace. Um, especially as we look at our new clinic, you know, how can we use our MAs, uh, LPNs, and RNs truly at top of license as well as our PharmDs? Um, so this is a, a picture of our new clinic um, building. I would say that um, in our hospital specific recommendations. Um, there were conversations with Oliver Wyman about, as I mentioned, repurposing those acute beds. We really didn't get to a solution on what that might look like. 
um, in discussions with Bruce. Um, we uh, no no clear solutions for for what that would look like. Of course, we don't want our patients to incur additional expenses by transferring them somewhere else, especially when they don't need a higher level of care. Bruce really reinforced and is a very much a supporter of our primary care building um, and pri expanded primary care services. Um, that was something he really, really focused on and um, you know told us we were very much on the right track. We, there was a conversation as well about uh, REH, you know, rural emergency hospitals. I would say that that designation, the first hospital only went live the January of last year. I don't know if we have too much clear information on um, the impacts of that as of yet. What we do know for certain, though, is that we would lose our 340B program and, mo and would need to shut down our MVP pharmacy. And so I think that would be quite a community hit. It's not something that we um, are very excited about doing, that's for sure. Um, so really, we are continuing to focus on our primary care expansion, becoming more efficient there, as well as on outpatient therapy, uh, meeting patients where they are and where they need us. Um, I just threw this in here too, although I'm sure many of you have seen it, but bright spots from our community meeting for Oliver Weinman, which we worked together with them um, uh, for our presentation. Um, so my last slide, I just wanted to reiterate, we're fully committed to working together. We're very open to new innovative models. We are inquisitive. We want to learn new ways to do things. We're invested in our community um, and as a partner at the local and state and federal level. Um, and we are committed to being good stewards of our resources as well. We don't take it for granted. So I think that's it from my end. I appreciate um, y'all's patience and, and attention to our presentation. So thank you. I think I'll, well, I'll leave my slides up for a few minutes in case I need to flip back for any questions, but thank you all. Thank you very much, Ms. Sweetnam. And, um... You did a great job in your first time, so congratulations thank and thank you for doing this. Um, I have a few questions, probably not too many. Um, on inpatient services, it looks like it's about $2.1 million in budgeted revenue. Is that right? Stephen, do you have that in front of you? That would be just the acute patients. Just the acute patients. Okay, so the swing beds, when they're not being used for acute, is not counted towards that 2.1? No, the 2.1 is the actual build acute stays, and then the swing bed revenue that's budgeted of $9 million is for the swing bed patient days. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And then, in terms of your providers, how many physicians do you have um, serving the inpatient services? We have one hospitalist. Um, as Olivia said, they rotate on a week-by-week -week basis from 8 a.m. Monday morning till the following 8 a.m. Monday morning. And that one individual is responsible 24-7 for all of the patients in the building. Um, they, on an average, we had them average out, they spend roughly 80 hours, give or take, in that seven-day period. Um, they aren't physically in the building. They're here every day, um, but they don't stay here 24-7 because we do have, um, although they're always available after hours, we do have the emergency department provider in-house 24-7, and they are the first line of um, resource for the nursing staff if they have a question about an inpatient. And then if they don't, they can always call the hospitalist. Okay, so you have one hospitalist and then do you have one full-time physician in the ED? There is a full-time provider. It's actually almost always a physician assistant, but they do 12-hour shifts, 7A to 7P and 7P to 7A, and they are in the building all the time. And the RED and inpatient floor are connected. I mean, they're side by side. And I'm going to take you up on the offer to come and come and visit. I haven't been able to yet, but I will do so. Um, okay. hopefully yeah, excellent. Soon. Um, on the ED use, 
in 2022 is 2,497 and 4,220 for 24. What are you budgeting for 25? Um, it was budgeted at the same level that it was at for the first seven months. It's actually picked up the last couple of months. I believe the projected, let me find it here. Um, the projected and budgeted number for 24 and 25 was just under 4,000, 39.50. But it, the last, like I said, that was through April, May, and June have been back up to being high again. So it, on track, we're budgeted or looking to be where she's at. So currently, our budgeted amount is less than that 4,200. Okay. And is 4,200, that's the projected for fiscal year 24 or the budgeted? Yeah. That's the projected if they continue at what they've done the last couple of months for the next okay. two months, this month and next. Um, so that's that's about 11 patients a day. Does that sound about right? Yes. And it's a, my calculation, I'm not a CFO, but I'm calculating a 69% increase from fiscal year 22. What's driving that increase in the ED utilization? Um, you know, definitively, not sure. Um, I think my primary gut re reaction would be that it's two things a lack of primary care availability in brattleboro area and at the same time brattleboro does have an urgent care center that originally was open 24 7 and it has not been for a while in fact last i knew i think it's only open 12 hours a day so my presumption would be that people that would have been going to that urgent care center now, of course, have a choice between Brattleboro's ER or our ER, and a lot of them come up here, but that's just a rhetorical guess, if you will. Yeah, I would, sure. I would agree. I would agree with Stephen. Like, I think it feels like the secret's out from our ED, especially like post renovation. Um, they're really, really skilled clinicians. We have nurses who have traveled in their past at much larger facilities. They're really very skilled and competent and kind of handle anything. And I think the Brattleboro um, ED, um, similarly, you know, extremely skilled, but does have a really high percentage of mental health um, or substance use kind of hold patients uh, in their ED generally. And I and I we have found that, and this is anecdotal in talking to patients, but if they know that they're stable enough that they can drive to see us, or also our wait times are generally um, pretty low, especially compared to a Cheshire or up north to Dartmouth. It does feel like that is driving some of our volume. And then, of course, to Stephen's point, there are no 24-7 urgent care offerings. So anything that's kind of happening after 6 p.m. Um, is coming into the ED. Do I think that's ideal from an ED utilization standpoint? Probably not, but it's the current milieu we're working in. I think probably also in the last couple of years, just again, anecdotally, but people are traveling more. You know, people weren't traveling to Vermont particularly <laughs> uh, for vacationing, if you will, much in 2021, 22. And the last couple of years, there's, there's a lot more people around, period. Yeah, we definitely have a lot of tourists and second home seasonal residents who come in. And, and that's the point too, like they're not established anywhere around here. So, um, you know, it, it's, they don't really ha have the option of kind of popping in to see their established PCP. And, you know, having these patients served in the ED that could be in primary care, urgent care is certainly expensive for the system. What are your plans and strategies to get them to urgent care or primary care to fill that void so that they're not going to the ED? Yeah. Well, so I, part of that would be assuming that they're here Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, I think when we look at a lot of our ED patients are out of town, they're not local people that would otherwise be going to primary care if we could fit them in. Um, you know, a lot of them are Saturday, Sunday, after hours. Um, 
you know, we, we do have the ability and generally fit particularly our own, you know, primary care patients into the primary care clinic during the day if they need to be seen urgently. We don't have a lot of those people walking around the building to walk into the ER. So, I, think, I mean, go ahead. Oh, I agree with Stephen, but also like as part of our clinic, um, our new clinic. And just to be clear, like that new clinic isn't giving us like tons of extra space to play with. It's really like appropriately, um, and not even appropriately, we've had to do some um, rearranging of spaghetti, as Lynn likes to say, in terms of um, making sure that we have the space that we need. It's definitely not additional or much extra space for us. It's more appropriate um, number of rooms for clinic providers. That being said, we are trying to carve out space for an urgent care um, area. So it's nice for our providers. Sometimes our providers like that break of urgent care. You know, it's it, it's real episodic and kind of a quick um, a quick day for them. So sometimes providers like that break of during, doing urgent care. So we are definitely looking into that model um, for the new clinic. We don't really have space to do that right now. Um, and I assume that would decant some from the EB volume. Um, and even if we could do extended hours there similarly, it obviously wouldn't help our overnight volume in the ED. There's just really no option for people around here you know, seven to seven overnight. Have you considered ex extending the hours of the clinic? Yeah, we've talked about it. We don't we don't have current current um, solid plans, but especially in our new clinic, we've talked about extended hours. Yeah. But the not 11. Overnight. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I was just thinking with our ahead. overnight problem. Out of the 11 or so patients in the ED on a day, do you have directionally a sense of how many of those could be treated in urgent care or primary care? I feel like if I told you anything, I would be guessing because I don't have the percentages in front of me. We could definitely kind of pull the, um, that data based on triage um, level and use that as an approximate, um, as an approximation, um, but I'd have to, I can get back to you on that. I don't want to guess. Okay, fair enough. Um, the provider productivity, I think, Mr. Brown, you said you're trying to increase one or two more patients a day for primary care. Yes. What's the, what's your average currently for patients a day in primary care? Chris, you just ran that, you said, didn't you? Is it like 11? Uh, it's 11 with behavioral health. It's it's probably more more like 10 if we just looked at primary care. So, so looking up at 10 to 12 or 11 to 13? Right. As a starting point, I and mean, unfortunately, there's only so much we can do in the existing space to make more productivity. I mean, as we said, we're working on processes and things like that, but unfortunately there's a lot of the providers only have their office slash exam room period, and there's no room to have a second exam room. So there's a lot of, not a lot we can do until we get into our new building to increase much beyond that. I would also add, like to add to clarify that those those um, we're we're still operating in some respects in a post COVID um, uh, appointment durations, and we're working towards some twenty minute appointments had been extended to forty minutes. The the no, that that'll offer a slight uptick very easily in the short term. Agreed. It looks like you didn't have benchmarking data. Do, do you use anything for benchmarking provider productivity? Chris, Not currently, it. but Chris is looking into that. Yeah. We're, we're evaluating MGMA. We've also been uh, reaching out to neighboring neighboring peers. We plan to participate in MGMA's survey for next year and we'll get the that data then at a d discounted rate. Um, there's obviously other vendors as well, but I think we're really. 
I could say we're okay. in the process of more aggressively looking at benchmarks and, and the challenges with our unique um, rural environment and current physical landscape layout. Um, it's hard to find true comparisons, but we're, we're working through that. I also think that's um, getting this. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, I interrupt you. Please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I do think like this, I mean, just, I think there's, there's a couple of things. I think Chris and Lynn are working really diligently on standardizing practices in the clinic. I think as as Grace Cottage has grown, there's been some kind of individualized kind of practices um, that they are working to standardize into there's one Grace Cottage way instead of multiple provider ways. I know at every hospital I've ever worked at, that's been a challenge, but I think in primary care, the more we can streamline that, the more efficient um, that we will become. Um, so I, I think there's there's work to be done there. And I think the conversation that I was talking about earlier in terms of uh, the thrive, you know, to use SVMC's um, terms here, I think part of this is having candid discussions and being really transparent with this data. I think that we have work to do there, um, not only with benchmarking our own internal data and then finances and kind of clinic productivity. I think Chris and Lynn are starting some really great work in that area too. And I think that will be really helpful in terms of driving consistency and standardization in the clinic. And then you gave the example of the patient who was um, $54,000 and you got paid $8,000. Um, do you have a sense uh, hospital-wide what your Medicaid cost coverage is? That example is 14%, but I was curious if you had a sense of over all of the patients, what percentage of the costs are covered by Medicaid? Um, I can give you that. Hold on. I just... Find the right piece of paper. <laughs> Forty-seven percent. They're actually paying forty seven percent of our cost if I do the facility as a whole. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and we just obviously have a limited ability to make that up on the commercial side. I thought one of your presentations was interesting in terms of like the most significant factor in commercial rate increase was the leveraging kind of the size, the 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 kind of group, not purchasing power, but ability to to impact. We obviously have none of that because we're just so teeny tiny. So we we don't have as much of an ability to make that up anywhere else, obviously. Right. Um, and then on the travelers, you said you were 1.2 million over fiscal year 24 budget. Right. So we've had we've had throughout most of this fiscal year um, in the nursing department, we have had as many as seven, which is unheard of for us, um, including two LNAs. We've only ever used RNs prior to that. Um, or needed travelers, I should say, for our ends. We've also had one physical therapist the whole year and two diagnostic imaging most of the year. Um, and if all goes well, as Olivia said, we will be down to hopefully none or just one in nursing by the end of this year. And I know Crystal at the moment is interviewing a physical therapist in hopes that maybe we can be down to none in that department as well, though I think we probably will still have one for a while. So you have 30, as of May of 24, you had 31 nurses in total, FTE, and then you had an additional seven travelers in 24. The, no, the number that's budgeted, wait a minute, which report are you looking at? Because they're in they're in the total FTEs, but are they on a separate line? I'm trying to remember the oh, one. I'm, I'm looking at the, um, I think it's the workbook paper, the staff turnover document. Let me pull that up. Um, well, let me ask you it this way. Was it 
Is it 24 nurses and seven travelers or is it 31 nurses and seven travelers? The, those are that was just that's just vacancies. So there's eight. Oh no, there there were five vacant in the workbook submission you're looking at. Yeah, Staff sorry, I'm in the employees. I'm in the employed column. Employed as of May 24 says 31.8 FTE nurses. Now this is only turnover. Right. There's 31 FTEs of nurses, of which five of them are vacant. Those. So at that point, we had five travelers. Got it. Okay. 31 employed, five travelers. Correct. Okay. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and, and answering my questions. Any other board members? Sure. I can jump in. Um, this is Tom. Hello, Olivia um, and, and team. Um, I'll join Owen in welcoming you. Um, in, in my early career, I was a physical therapist at Dartmouth-Hitchcock in a spine center. And uh, I became pretty well aware of Grace's um, swing bed capacity. It's an important need. We, we relied on it at times. And um, I just wanted to mention that. Um, my role here is to review all the, the material you submit for your budget and then comment and ask questions about it. Um, so I wanted to just start by saying I noted the uh, primary care and rural health focus. I think that's excellent. I think you're on the right track. I also noted in the in your narrative, um, there was a mention of IHI's age-friendly health system project. Um, that makes great sense with the swing bed focus and primary care and rural health. Um, and also I, I, I heard in your presentation, um, the terms like just culture, safety and reliability. Um, and th so those efforts may have been underway in years past, um, but this is the first time that I've heard um, those kind of high reliability terms, specific terms used with Grace, and um, I think that that's great. I think there's a lot of really good stuff going Thanks. on. Um, so just to reorient myself, um, your operating margin is budgeted at minus 2.3%. The total margin is around 12 for the upcoming year. Is that correct? Yes, and part of the total margin is because of um, including the CON that we do have to start our new primary care clinic, it is currently scheduled to break ground if all goes well with the Act 50 permit in April of next year. So there will be significant capital fundraising toward the first construction part of that project mm -hmm. recognized in next fiscal year's budget. Right. And that's that fundraising project is the 20 million project, correct? correct? Yep. Okay. Yes. Um, do you know the the range of donated amounts and the the average or the median? I'm trying to understand if this is, um, it's it's been known in the Upper Valley forever that you have a lot of money that's coming in, but is it a, a few wealthy donors or is there kind of, is it is it widespread support? How do you understand where that money is coming from for our fundraising as a whole, or for specifically for this capital project? Um. I'd like to hear an answer to both. Um, we get widespread community support throughout the year. So the roughly one and to one and a half to two million dollars we get every year to help us with our operating um, is, and Andrea can chime in if she would like, if I don't say it correctly, um, but is everything from a lot of $5 donations up to, um, you know, Ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar, usually one fifty or hundred thousand dollar donation a year, um, and the capital project is exactly the same. We have everything from a lot of five dollar donations up to, at the moment, the highest one is the person who started off the project, which is five million. She's received, I believe, at least two one million dollar ones at this point, and 
lots of different multiple thousand dollar ones who are up, they're up to almost half of that goal already. Um, I, I would just say though that like, and um, Andrew can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I like Sharma and Andrea are, are fundraising experts like to say that the, the clinic is in the loudest silent phase ever. So, so they, I, I would say that there's been a lot of, of, um, I, I would say that for that, for the clinic specifically, Stephen's exactly right. For the general kind of fundraising, there's lots of the five dollar donations, but that kind of focus for the clinic of like this very broad kind of like all comers message for 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 fundraising for the clinic. Um, they're still kind of technically coming out of that silent phase. So much of right. uh, many of the of the donors have been large donors. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think there are, and Andrea again can correct me. There are several large donors who truthfully are currently waiting for us to get our Act 250. They weren't going to commit until we first got our CON, which of course took a while. And now that we are in the Act 250 process, once we got that, you know, once we actually get that and they know it's going to happen, if you will, then there are several large donors waiting for that to happen. Okay. That's helpful. Um, on page three of your narrative, you answered the question about community benefit. Um, by noting the size of donations that you're receiving and also noting um, that you employ people from the community, um, mm -hmm. neither of those is considered a traditional community benefit that would be used to justify a tax exemption. Um, are, are you familiar with the Lown Institute's Fair share index. I'm not. I am not. All right. Um, so it's Lown, uh, L O W N, but pronounced like gown. Um, and they look at a com hospital's community benefits and their tax exemptions and dollars. And in 2023, your community benefit, as they um, documented from uh, your tax filings was $317,931, while you received $1.46 in tax exemptions. So that's you received $1.1 million more than you contributed. How are they getting that on our tax filing? Are they, I mean, to be I'm honest, not, part of the... No, I'm, I'm just curious if you know the answer to this question. Yeah. Like, for instance, the Medicaid shortfall is per considered on that Schedule H as part of your community benefit and justifying your tax exemption as well. Right, right. I, I know, and I think that that's um, somewhat controversial. I, I'm not sure of their exact methods, Okay. Um, but I do know that they're open and transparent about it. Um, so um, if you wanted to give them a call to understand how they arrived at that, I'm sure that they'd, okay. they'd talk with you. Um, on your turning to the profit and loss statement, um, mm -hmm. you, bad debt amounted to $395,000 in the budget for 2020 um, and just over a million for this year or for 2025, while free care was $212,000 in 2020. And 553 for 2025. So it looks like the the debt is rising quite a bit faster for for your community than the free care that's being received. It is, and and then truthfully, you hit the nail ahead when you started with 2020 budget. Um, COVID, truthfully, yep. and not to keep bouncing on it, but you know, so many people that had good health insurance either lost it or health insurance deductibles and co-pays, the things that make up bad debt, um, a lot of our bad debt have just continued to increase due to people either not working or not having the coverage. Um, in all honesty, I think that a lot of that bad debt, or I know that a lot of that bad debt would be considered free care if the people would actually fill out the reduced fee application but they don't, especially around here, more so on the local people, they don't want anybody to see their income tax returns. 
<laughs> in the local community. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that are on the bad debt list, if I looked at it, that certainly should be free care, but without them filling it out, you can't call it that. Well, um, Stephen, I appreciate your the candor with your response and uh, about it. That was probably the best answer that I've that I've heard. And um, you beat me to the next point was that, according to ProPublica, about sixty percent of people with debt would be eligible for free care um, had they been screened for eligibility. And I know it's a challenge, but I just wanted to um, share that information back with you all because I, I, as I started out. I've um, experienced what you do. I know firsthand how important it is, um, and I believe in what you're trying to do. Um, in my current role, I review the material you submit and then ask questions about what I found. So I'm doing that, and hopefully um, we all get better together. Yeah, we actually do. If I think it probably, I think it said it somewhere in there, but if it did not, we actually employ a full-time resource advocate that's embedded within our, um, it's, her office is actually within the rural health clinic, but she does the whole facility where she actually um, reaches out to every person who has a self-pay balance over, I forget what the limit is, it's a pretty low limit, to make sure everybody realizes they are eligible for reduced fees and is happy to help them fill out the applications and get them to them. but. It's getting them to fill them out. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if um, um, as your revenue grows, you've you've budgeted quite a bit over the the guidance, mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like it it will be growing. Um, that may be an area to to. Put some of that revenue toward um, the the Rand 5.0 data has been um, talked about. I know Bruce used it in his presentation. Um, your total facility price, according to that data, um, comes to 249 percent of Medicare, and your break-even price the way that they calculate that is 116%. Um, that's a gap of 133 points. And RAND considers that gap a measure of efficiency. The closer those two numbers are, the more efficient a hospital is. Um, and 133 points is, is large. It's not the, the most in the RAND data, but for example, last week, we were doing this with a hospital and their gap was 11 points. So um, that may be some of the space concerns you've been talking about with productivity, um, but it, it seems like that's another data point to show um, okay. that you're on the right track looking at productivity and efficiency. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, RAND also has quality metrics by Quantros. They, they look at um, quality and reliability, and they're one of the few um, quality metric sites that have aspects of reliability and safety built in. Um, and you're in the the lower part of the middle quartile. And I'm I'm just um, I know you might not be familiar with them, but I was hoping to use this as an opportunity to just hear your thoughts about um, how you assess quality. And um, I think Heather, you mentioned is the quality person. Mm -hmm. um, I just try to understand more of what, uh, where you're at currently and what direction you're trying to head. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, we assess quality in, in you know, of course, different ways. Um, we have, um, you know, our standard quality measures that we follow. So um, I'm sure you're familiar with BPQ. So we participate in a lot of quality um, projects with them. So we've done the suicide project with them. We also do the uh, Medicare beneficiary uh, quality improvement project. So that data. You know, we're tracking various quality measures such as um, 
uh, median time ED to arrival to discharge, left without being seen, our CLABSIs, our um, hospital acquired infections, serious reportable events, um, different different things uh, to that. We of course have each of our quality um, our, at our meeting, our each department comes to the quality meeting with a quality project and we focus on that while we track that. We don't use Quantrus, we use SQSS, which is more uh, geared towards critical access hospitals. I know a few of them in, in Vermont use those, but uh, but all of these are, are, are oh, kitty cat. <laughs> so all of these are, um, are reviewed, uh, you know, at different, um, different committees that everyone attends, yeah. Are you um, do you do any benchmarking with those data? Are you part of a, a group that you um, learn with or or do anything like that? So more like, um, well, of course, we have VPQ, but more benchmarking. We use the standard like the CMS benchmarks for HCAPs and different things like that, whereas NHSN for our hospital acquireds, um, of course, you know, we look at Vermont. Um, report card and look at that, but it's more based on, um, and press gainy we use for, you know, like I said, our surveys. So, uh, those are more of our, our, um, we do blueprint for health for the, um, mm -hmm. for the clinic. So that, you know, is looked at with patient center, medical home benchmarking that way too. Great. That's helpful. So, um, I imagine you can see what I'm, I'm trying to do here. You're, you're asking for, uh, a 2.5% price increase, a 12% NPR. Um, your total margin is quite large. Um, it would be what would make me more comfortable about uh, approving the request and would make me feel good years going forward is if we saw, we were able to see how you used that revenue to address the community benefit deficit, the community needs, um, and the inequality concerns, right? And so um, what are your priorities, your objectives, your key performance indicators to address those things? Um, there's a lot of good going on, um, but you are asking for more than what we've written for in guidance. And so understanding how that's gonna be used um, would be helpful. Um, Chair Foster had a conversation about people um, and ED visits, and I immediately went to, I know that that area around Sunapee and around Grace. And yes, there are a lot of people who spend three or four months there, go back to their primary home for three or four months, come back for three or four months. Um, and I'd worry they're using an expensive site like an ED for their primary care needs. And so that'd be another thing about um, the revenue that's coming in, trying to get a handle on that and see if it's possible to redirect any of those um, patients uh, toward a lower resource setting. It, you'll have one when, when you open the, the primary care facility, but um, that's, that's something to to look at. And the other part, I was I was worried when I was started asking about the the donations coming in and trying to get a sense of the gap that may exist between the wealthy people that vacation and sometimes live a good part of the year there, and the folks that are born there, raised there, live there, and aren't from wealthy families. Um, and we know across the state, people are struggling with. Uh, mental health concerns, substance use disorders. And I wondered what proportion of those emergency visits are due to that. And those conditions haven't been mentioned in your presentation. Um, so with all the good things going on, I, I, I don't want to lose sight of the, the growing problems of death by suicide in the state and making sure that uh, we've got systems and processes in place for that. But, um, but just thank you so much for the presentation, all the material you submitted um, and your willingness to um, talk with me about some of the questions I had after reviewing the material. I really appreciate it. 
Thank so you. I was so also, go ahead. I was also going to mention, that, you know, as a part of our whole community health needs assessment process, we work closely with both Broadboro Memorial Hospital and the Broadboro Retreat to address, you know, the needs of our community in this area as well. And I was also one. Did you just say people coming to Sunapee? <laughs> We're nowhere near have. Sunapee. We're over I'm an sorry. hour, well over an hour away. I'm sorry. I might have. <laughs> I might have gotten it confused. <laughs> it's all right. Thanks. I just wondered if you knew where we were. I do. <laughs> Townsend. So Tom, thank you so much for your comments. Those were really, really helpful. Um, definitely something to think about. My. My background is also in quality and Heather does such a fantastic job here. And <clears throat> I think like our internal quality, um, you know, tracking the number of SQSS, so the number of actual occurrences that we put in, I mean, the more the better. And we actually just did an RCA last week on uh, an ED intubation that we thought could have gone better. So I'm really proud of um, the quality department. And also we've talked about increasing our sampling so, you know, of course, most places sample a percentage for Prescani, and we're in conversation with how can we kind of drive up our sampling so we can get more responses to actually have enough denominator to do more benchmarking, because that's part of it, obviously, is that we're little. But um, I think your point's well taken, too, about mental health and substance use. I know one of our providers kind of left for a he and his wife both left kind of on a hiatus and did some very rural uh, work in Hawaii in primary care and bike traveling and he was saying his panel since he's come back has really changed like so much more substance use and so I think and our med staff they do a really fantastic job every med staff meeting part of that is education and we had some of the retreat staff at the last med, med staff meeting kind of talking about the sketamine work they're doing and refractory depression which was so exciting um, and, you know, that started our own kind of process here of viability of doing esketamine in our, our clinic. So um, with, you know, partnering in terms of protocol development and also just in our Wyndham Aging kind of collaboratives, talking with them about kind of that old Vermonter mentality of like, I don't need help, stubborn, I'll do it myself type of thing. But we know we have a mental health and social isolation um, issues. And so we've started the work of really saying, okay, like, how do we meet people where they are? We have Senior Life Solutions as a company. Um, they have a lot of clinics in the Midwest, but also just started in Maine. We've talked to two hospitals that have used them as kind of a staffing solution, but they help set up a program for intensive outpatient therapy for Medicare patients. Um, it might be the right thing for us. It might not. We're not sure yet because we're still in the preliminary phase of investigation. But um, any way that we can reach people, uh, I think Turning Point obviously does a great job for people with substance use um, issues, but uh, when we're talking specifically about kind of mental health crisis, especially in our aging population, um, it feels like our toolbox is kind of limited. And so whatever we can do to expand our access, one of the retired physicians um, who was at Brattleboro, who's now, you know, he's a she's a founding member of Wyndham Aging, but she in our meeting, we our strategy session we had a couple weeks ago, she kept saying it's one bird at a time. And I feel like that that has just stuck in my head of like with our limited transportation and people being isolated and where they live geographically and social social isolation, especially as their spouses are passing away and their friends are dying, it really does feel like a one bird at a time <laughs> type of type of work. And I, I think also something that was really interesting to me, and this is coming from a Canadian who worked in public health for a while in Ontario before coming here is that in the Oliver Winder presentations, I spoke with Bruce about this a bit, but even here in my new role, like how are we engaging with our public health counterparts to figure out where there's synergy in our work? And I, we haven't, we haven't fully explored that yet. So I hoping, I'm hoping that there's opportunities there too. Great. Um, well, thank you for answering the questions. Um, I appreciate it. And um, thank you, Stephen. I, I enjoyed uh, your responses as well. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Any other board member questions for the Grace Cottage folks? I can Great. jump in and with I'll... a cup. Sorry. <laughs> I was oh, go ahead, Robin. trying Sorry. not to jump the gun, but I'll jump in. Um, I just have a couple. Um, I wanted to 
I hear a little bit more about your plans for Jerry Psych. You mentioned it in your narrative that this was something you were exploring. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I that's what I was just talking about a little bit in terms of that senior life solutions program. So the yeah. senior life solutions program, um, Medicare specifically, um, intensive outpatient therapy, and it's a combination of one on one with a therapist as well as group therapy. And so um, Senior Life Solutions, if you kind of Google that, you can, you can get to their website. They have a lot of, I think about 150 clinics in the Midwest. Um, mm -hmm. And so their penetration in New England is not very great right now. Um, I think the main the main um, location, we just talked to their CEO and some of their staff members last week or the week before, and they've only, they've just started. They're just a couple months in. Um, it's, the question we have, so from a financial standpoint, there might be, you know, a small, it, it might be a small pickup in terms of our facility fees that we would capture on our cost report. The question we really have, though, is if we have the um, catchment area to support the program, if we have enough people, we could actually get, um, get invested, get on board. Um, it's, obviously sometimes difficult to find six to 10 people who are interested and available for um, individual and group therapy. It's a lot. It's like three to four sessions a week, depending, but their outcomes, as you would imagine, are fantastic. <laughs> um, so if you can do that much therapy, you know, you're committed to it really like their engagement in the community, their engagement with their peers. Um, it just is, it sounds like pretty life-changing for the people who can participate in the program. So um, we have had, we talked to a small critical access hospital in Wisconsin, and that CEO had actually started the program in Michigan at his former post and then um, in Maine. So it's on our, uh, our project tracker for our planning meetings. Uh, Chris is leading kind of that PMO initiative. So um, we'll continue to do due diligence work there. But if we have the catchment area, I think it's a great program. It's, it's just whether or not we can make it work with quite a small most of these places we've talked to, they're within like an hour of Milwaukee or within an hour of Portland. And so you're kind of like, oh, <laughs> you know, do we have enough in Brattleboro that we could swing it? So yeah, that's the due diligence place we're in right now. Got it. And how long, I was just curious, like if you decide to either do it or not do it, when approximately when would you make that decision and how long does it take to set up, that kind of thing? Yeah, I would say... Um, I would say in this coming year, we'll make the decision whether or not it's viable for us. Um, yeah. from, their, from their perspective, um, I don't know if we'd have, I don't think we'd have, I'm just thinking there's some questions about kind of like licensing for space if it's delineated as clinical. I don't think we'd have that kind of barrier because we would have space um, currently licensed for clinical provision. Um, it's and they will start a program with virtual therapists, um, uh, especially for the one-on-one, -on -one, if they can't find someone to hire locally. I'm, again, I'm assuming staffing will be tricky for them, but they um, they kind of laugh at us a little bit because they're like, you've not been to North Dakota, which I haven't. So <laughs> <laughs> apparently it's tricky there too. But um, so, you know, they don't seem to be that um, put out by that. But um, I think for them, it definitely is a couple months off the ground um in terms of staffing uh and then and then really it's figuring out the referral mechanisms so uh, when we talked to maine they were saying from their inpatient you know they also have a really robust swing bed program so they kind of refer out of their swing bed so when they're discharging that swing bed patient they can get referred into the program as well as like their community health team or primary care referring into it the other thing that's interesting for both of those people that we've talked to is they had no outpatient psychiatric offerings whatsoever, which mm -hmm. I was like, wow, that seems crazy. So that like, that's kind of like their one lever to pull right. for any Jerry psych. We obviously have a therapist and two psych NPs, but they're very, very busy and yeah. they don't do that type of like intensive therapy. So perhaps that's another referral mechanism for us, you know, into like getting more intensive therapy. Um, so yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and then my last question was about the physical therapist FTE. It sounds like you've been filling essentially that position with a, with a contractor agency staff. Is that right? Do I, did I understand that correctly? Or is that so, net new? 
We have, well, there's two. We have had one FTE this past year who is here as a traveler. I um, see. Yeah. We, and as I said, we're hopeful to re replace that person with a staff member. We, yeah. in the budget, we added one additional FTE on top of that. Once okay. we have the space to have that person be able to treat patients. Got it. Um, uh, we're and... so shortage on space right now that, uh, as Olivia referred to, um, they've been so busy over there. There's been a couple of days in the last couple of weeks that it's a good thing we've been having good weather outside because <laughs> some of the therapy had to happen outside. <laughs> That sounds kind of nice, actually. Um, it is if it's not a rainy day, but that's you know, true. And there are some things that you can probably provide better therapy outside, but they're literally, literally tripping over each other in our um, physical therapy gym. Yeah. Uh, and Olivia, I think you mentioned um, part of the additional PT was related to the wait times you've been seeing, but I didn't notice wait times data in your submission. It's if you've submitted that and I didn't find it in my email, then I apologize. But I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what kind of wait times you're seeing for PT and other services. Oh, actually, Crystal, I think you're probably still online, Mansfield. Do you want to talk a little bit about kind of the average number of patients you're seeing outpatient right now and how you kind of fit that in with the staff you have and wait times? Because it's so impressive. Sure. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so my goal for new evals getting in the door is within a two week window. We are currently booking, um, unless I get a cancellation callback, um, we're currently booking new evals just a little over that goal. So we're out three weeks, sometimes four weeks. So right now it's the middle of October, excuse me, the middle of August. We're booking into the end of September. Um, for some of our specialty services, those patients have to wait a little longer. I don't have not all of my clinical staff is trained up in the same skill set. So sure. for instance, you know, women's pelvic health, it, I only have two practitioners. So people wait a little longer to get in for that service. Um, and, you know, pre COVID, I would just say not to it pre COVID. We were, we were, we had a good day. If we had an average of maybe 25 patients on, on average through the clinic. And right now my daily average is 49 point, five, I want to say just under 50. Um, there are some days here when I have more staff here when we're pushing 60, 65. Last week we had a 72 patient day here and we're literally treating in the in the parking lot and in the hallway and um, it's it's not ideal and um, I mean, we're safe as we can be and patients have fun. It's good crew, but it's we need more room. And I can't grow the business, and I know there's business out there to 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 be had um, because we don't have enough space. So, great, thank you. Those were uh, my two follow ups that weren't already answered. Thanks so much for your presentation. Thank you. Any other board members before I turn to the HCA? I have just a couple. Um... As everyone else just said, thank you. I, I just have like a few specific questions left. Um, in in our workbook document, I didn't see your Medicare Advantage revenue pulled out separately, and I was just trying to figure out if that's in the commercial revenue or in the Medicare traditional revenue. It's in the commercial revenue. Okay. D do you think uh, can you break that out so we can? I'm work. Work, work with the IT department and the billing department to see if we can set up new financial classes going forward to try and be able to start tracking that separately. In all honesty, okay. it was never, we had almost none of it up until very recently. Um, and now all of a sudden we realize it's a lot of our patients have it and it needs to be tracked separately. Okay. Um, I think that's the situation for several hospitals over the years. So. Thanks. Um, so um, I'm just trying to understand the swing bed reimbursements. Are they, um, how, how do swing bed reimbursements work? Are they, are they, are they DRG based? Are they duration based? Are they, and how do they compare to the acute admission reimbursements? Um, depending on the payer for, for Medicare, they are 
exactly the same way. As a critical access hospital, um, you file your cost report at the end of the year. They calculate the costs to take care of um, one of the lines is the inpatient floor, which of course has both acute and swing, and they then divide your total cost for taking care of all of those patients by your number of patient days for the year in that category, and Medicare pays you your costs for their portion of taking care of those patients. Um, in our case, truthfully, the Medicare and the, I mean, the acute and swing cost per day is almost equal. It's within a few dollars each year. Um, for the Medicare Advantage, we, in essence, get paid exactly the same way. All of the Medicare Advantage contracts pay us throughout the year on our cost per day as calculated by the most recently submitted Medicare cost report. The only problem is that there is never any reconciliation. So if costs continue to go up each year, which of course in this current market inflation they do, with the true Medicare patients, part of that cost report submission is settling at the end of the fiscal year on your current year's fiscal costs. The Medicare Advantage, you don't ever get that. So if, if the daily rate goes up $100 from the previous cost report, you never get that extra $100 on any of those Medicare Advantage days. Um, for the commercial payers, most of them are either percentage of, most of them are a percent of the charges the same way as the acute, um, the true commercial, not the Medicare Advantage, are Percent of charge is the same way as acute admissions are. For Medicaid, they have a daily rate, as referred to in that slide that Olivia gave us, um, and it's not nearly adequate for taking care of a skilled nursing patient. It doesn't take into account any rec, you know, anything based upon what they actually might be having. Um, and most of our skilled nursing patients here are getting intensive therapies, whether it be rehab or um, IV antibiotics or both, um, which are part of the reason you have such large write-offs on those. Okay. Um, with regard to the geriatric psychiatry uh, discussion, um, the this, um, sorry, I have to remember this, serving, it's called Senior Life Solutions, sounds like a, 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 a great program and it clearly fills a need I think it's probably pretty unrecognized for outpatient Jerry's sake. Um, I think a lot of, I, mean, I I've, you may know I'm an emergency physician. So a lot of when people in my line of work talk about Jerry psych, I think a lot of people are thinking about inpatient uh, for patients who have uh, memory challenges and then some, some superimposed behavioral disturbances such that other facilities aren't appropriate. Is that, um, is that a, uh, you know, a potential need that that you've looked at trying to fill, and is, is that, and, and what are your thoughts on that? We have not. We've not actually started any conversations or process in terms of looking at inpatient Jerry psych. Um, we don't have any inpatient psych safe rooms currently, like psych safe as I'm used to, you know, mm. as I'm used to them in a a larger facility. Um, we do have one um, in the ED. Um, I don't know, Stephen, historically, has that ever been a conversation? Not to my knowledge, no. It's definitely something yeah. we look at. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't propose that I understand the, the <laughs> economics of that either. So I was just curious if that was part of the conversation though. Um, and then one last ED follow-up question. Um, you mentioned that a lot of patients come from, you think the growth may be from patients who are coming from far away. Do you track at all uh, um, where patients are from, their home zip code when they come to you? Because, you know, this sort of gets into this sort of conversation about, you know, could you divert them, um, you know, and if they're your own patients, you can, doing 
great primary care, you can hopefully keep them from going to the emergency department in the first place. But I was just curious if you under, understand where geographically your patients receive their primary care or are primarily from. We should be so, able to. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. So, so we have we have done this work. Um, we, we are well. We're always doing that work in terms of a panel analysis, um, from even just from a population health perspective. But in terms of of ED uh, ED volume, uh, we've done the work in the past where we've looked at triage and we've looked at uh, panel. Uh, essentially, meaning if if a patient is is owned by one of our primary care physicians and they've been seen in our ED and they have a triage level of four to five, then, then we have looked at those. We are starting to look at those again, especially as we continue to evaluate implementing a same day program. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Thanks everyone. Thank you. And I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Good morning. Um, thanks so much, Sam Paish with the Office of Healthcare Advocate. Um, welcome, Ms. Sweetenham. Um, a couple of questions. I wanted to thank you for all the work, uh, your hospital for all the work you've done coming into compliance and working with our office on Act 119. Um, I know we have a couple questions about a couple of uh, kind of exclusions from the policy, but I think we'll follow up and not do that because it's too technical in the hearing. Um, I want to ask you at a high level, I mean, I think Grace is unique in its level of commitment historically and investment in primary care. And I'm sure you're aware that some people from a financial perspective criticize hospitals for owning primary care just as like a, you know, losing money from a losing money perspective. I'm, I'm curious, I imagine you've, you know, looked at that. I'm curious how you respond to like criticisms of that. Well, um, I think for us, and as you said, I think like the commitment to the community and our commitment to the overall health and wellness of our like community broadly defined here is mm -hmm. the most important thing. I think I've never been anywhere where we have primary care providers who might run out to a nursing home and see a patient or might run and do a home visit. Like it's remarkable. And of course that doesn't happen that frequently, but the fact that our providers are willing and have so much ownership and um, feel that closeness with the patients, I think is why um, our patients are so loyal and like satisfied with the care here. I think they can tell that the people who care for them are quite devoted to them and, you know, committed to their well-being. Um, so for us, I think it's just the, it's just the way we do business. I mean, I think primary care is always going to be the cornerstone of the care we provide here. Um, and you know the the swing our swing bed program and our rehab program. I mean rehab the type of rehab crystals um, discussing on the outpatient side. That's really like holistic well being that we're talking about. You know it's so part and parcel of the primary care picture. So mm -hmm. yeah. No, thank you. That's helpful. Um, I'm curious just if you mapped out what your commercial rate and NPR increase would need to be to get to a zero percent operating margin. I'm curious if you did that exercise or not. No, I did not. Okay. okay. Um, and my last question is a little bit technical. I apologize, but I was interested in your community health um, needs assessment, your implementation plan. Um, and there was something in there about depression screening, which it says you do for everyone age 12 and above, um, which I think is, is great. My only concern with that, and this came up actually a little bit in the one care hearings as they had a similar like mental health screening pilot. If you screen a lot of people, do you, you I'm hoping um, that you feel like there's enough providers to see these patients. Because I mean, one thing, as I imagine, you know, if you screen more people, you're going to document and identify potentially more need. Um, so I'm curious about that, if you thought about that issue potentially. Yeah, I think it's a really, really good point. Um, I think on our inpatient side, um, whenever we're screening for mental health or kind of acute, any, you know, delirium, depression, any of those screening um, criteria tools, um, helpful for the way we're treating patients on the inpatient side during their stay. Obviously, referrals on the outpatient side become a little trickier um, for ED or primary care as well. 
Um, I know nationally, and I know Bruce talks about this in his presentations, nationally, there's a need and we're no different here. Um, we, I would say that um, Meredith, uh, our uh, therapist who's in the clinic, um, is extremely you know, skilled and talented and also very flexible for us. So sometimes if we're pulling her up, um, onto the floor to see inpatients, you know, she's, she will fit those in when she can, but, um, that's not a, you know, a systematic approach <laughs> to the larger need. Mm. Um, so I think we do as, as well as we can, knowing that there's a community shortage. Thank you. Those are my questions. Appreciate it. Great. Um, nothing else from the board. So thank you for your presentation and your time this morning. And, um, uh, we can adjourn and we will go off the record and we will be back at, I think it's 12, uh, yeah, 12 o'clock. So we'll adjourn until 12 o'clock.